Hey everybody, welcome back. John Shutsky here from the Senior Design Class BSE 508. You may be a person watching this and you're more than welcome to watch this. You might be a practicing engineer out in the real world. If that's the case, I'd love to hear your comments on this. We're gonna be talking about documenting your design journey. I actually have three parts to this. Number one, we're gonna talk about why it's so important um, to, to document everything you do. Uh, we'll then come back in the second part and talk about some additional information related to some specifics on documenting your design journey. And then part three video will be a kind of an overview at the high level looking at Google Docs, Google Documents as a way or Google Drive as a way to store information. That'll be the way most of you who are in BSE 508 and 509 store your information and again document your design journey. So I wanted to just start out here by talking a little bit about like, why is it so important? Like, why is this a skill that we spend so much time in engineering, particularly in undergraduate programs, like really preaching about the notion of documenting every bit and every piece of work that you do. Now, I, I think what I wanna talk about here is the fact that our world is becoming increasingly complex. And you know, especially in engineering, the, your ability to manage the, all of this data, all of this complexity, all of this information is only going to grow as a critical skill in the future. It'll be part of your future success. Please believe me when I say this. I will also say that this will, this will almost always for all of you be a work in progress. You'll always be refining. You'll always be doing things a little bit differently. You'll be learning new skills, new tools, new platforms. I think about my work 20 years ago. And you know, right now, today, I store a lot of my data and I do a lot of my organizational work on my iPhone. 20 years ago, as I recall, I was doing work on a, on a Palm Pilot. And before that, it was on Windows 3.1 software using an old program called Lotus. So information is, is constantly evolving. The other thing is, it's coming at us so fast. And while this is not going to be a talk about big data, I will say that the volume of data that allows the science of big data to exist, it, it's basically about having this massive, massive volume. I did wanna just showcase this. Um, right now, I'm not sure if you would wanna borrow this from me, but in the future, if anybody is interested in this book, the Human Face of Big Data. This book is actually a few years old. It's from 2012, so it's almost nine years old now, but it's a really awesome book. And I wanted to just showcase a few things and a few ideas in this book that talk about why the notion of like being able to manipulate, store, analyze, retain, uh, recall all of this data is so critical. First idea is that the rate of new data creation is accelerating exponentially from the beginning of all human civilization until the year 2003, you know, not that long ago, right? Like 18 or 19 years ago, all of humankind had only generated or produced about five exabytes of data. An exabyte, by the way, is 1 billion gigabytes. So, so during that long recorded human history till 2003, only five exabytes of data, Today, today, every two days, we're producing that same volume of data. Now, that's from the book that was written in 2012. And again, knowing that this rate of growth is changing exponentially, it's growing exponentially, you get an idea for how much data is being generated. And this data is changing the way in which we all relate to each other, the way in which we all communicate. If I go back to 2003, we didn't have Google Drive. We didn't have Google Docs. We weren't sharing information the way that we are today. We didn't have social media. We didn't have Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. You know, we had we had cameras on our phones, but it's just a totally different world today. And again, that that capacity and capability is only going to grow more in the future. We are all generating data constantly. I'm generating right now data with my iPhone as we speak. It's recording my location. It's got information coming and going through my email and my social media accounts and my alerts. I think about my Fitbit. It's right now recording my uh, both my location as well as my heart rate and all kinds of information. This will get 
uploaded the next time I sync to my Fitbit app into the cloud. So we're all generating as human beings, massive amounts of data. My keystrokes on my computer, as I access the internet or as I do different things on my computer. We're also processing tremendous information. The average person today processes. We have to process as much information as a person back in the 1500s did back in their entire lifetime. And again, the key idea here is that this rate of growth, the need to be able to do this effectively and efficiently, and hopefully without too much stress, that need will only grow exponentially as well as we move into the future. So how are we thinking about this in our design classes? I will talk to you about creating design records. In our classes, 508 and 509, you are expected to keep a complete, a thorough and complete record of all of the work that you do. And as I've talked about, this is a, a process class and processes involve the collection and analysis of a ton of information. I will let you review the slides and I'm gonna talk about this later when I talk about the Google Drive um, example when I get to part three of this presentation, but it is a complete record of all of that work that you do. Your ideas, your calculations, all of the data you handle, any graphics, graphs, plots, photographs, you're gonna be doing a progress report. So having this complete record will be really crucial. Um, some of you may also be required by your advisor to complete a work log. You might think, well, that's busy work, right? Like, why would I be treated like I'm in fourth grade? I, why would I have to do a work log? Well, let me tell you something. If your advisor is asking you to do this, they do it for a reason. And I will give you a very specific reason. I occasionally do some consulting engineering. Now, I typically do that outside of the state that I work in. But when I do consulting engineering, I bill by the hour. Honestly, I bill by, by five minute increments. Um, I, I do it by the hour, but I, but I calculate that out in, in incremental fashion. And if I'm making say $250 or $300 an hour as a consulting engineer, which would not be uncommon, the client that is paying for your skills as an engineer, your skills, your work, the information, the process, the journey that you're on with them or for them, they want to know exactly what you're doing. They want to know exactly what steps you took, how much time it took, and it's a critical part of billing as a consulting engineer. Now, I want to just talk about this a little bit. This is my sort of original idea, so I will take credit for this. It's a little bit morbid, so I'm just going to caution you in advance. I've always called this the bus on State Street rule. So State Street, if you're a student here at UW-Madison, you know exactly what State Street is. If you're not from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin, we have this kind of famous street. It's called State Street. It's where all the shops and the cool gift stores and the bars and the souvenir shops and the coffee shops, it's all located on State Street. It's not the only street in Madison, but it's probably the one that we're most noted for. Um, there are no vehicles allowed on State Street with the exception of buses city buses typically. Sometimes you'll find police cars on State Street. But the idea of the bus on State Street rule is, I want you to think about this. If you have been working in our classes, BSE 508 and 509, and you've been working with your team and your advisor, and you've got a project, and you've worked for say two thirds of the semester, you get to like, you get to, it, we're just a few weeks from the end of the semester, you're like maybe April 15th, You've done all this work. You've done this amazing amount of work. You're a, such a great student in engineering. And God forbid something happens to you on State Street. You step in front of a bus. You've got an injury, not, not a, not a life-threatening injury, but it's an injury that's going to keep you in the hospital for the next, say, three or four weeks until the end of the semester. You want to make absolutely sure that your team can pick up the work that you have done so far, that you have a complete record of it so that they can move your design forward. It's really crucial. And these kinds of things happen. I'll talk more about it. It's typically not because a person gets hit by a bus on State Street, but we have people who leave jobs, they move to new parts of the company, they get a promotion. You want to have that absolutely complete record of the work that you've done. Again, you're getting paid as an engineer for 
using your mind and using your skills to go through a process, you want to make sure that that process is super well documented. Some other very specific reasons why keeping a design notebook is critical. Number one, you might need to protect your intellectual property. Really important for things like patents and other ways of proving that you've done certain types of work or that you have made certain decisions that you've made. You need a, a complete record of all of those design decisions, especially if you're gonna go back and make a revision, you're gonna do a redesign or you're gonna iterate and make that product better. You wanna have that complete record in place. As I talked about with the bus on State Street rule, it's also required because you may not be around forever. Um, the majority of you who start your career, say at age 23 or 24, whatever, whatever age you go out and you get your first big engineering job, chances are by the time you hit 35, you're going to probably have had two or three or four different jobs. You're going to move either from company to company, from agency to agency, or you might move to another part of the, uh, another part of the country, another manufacturing plant, or another uh, design center or facility. And what you leave behind are those records of the work you have done as an engineer and as a designer. It will also save you time. You never wanna to have to go back and reinvent the wheel because you maintained poor records. Your time is your most precious asset. It is your most precious resource. Like I talked about, if I do a consulting job and I'm being paid $250 an hour, they're paying me for my time, yes, but it is that work product that was manufactured or developed during the time that I was working as an engineer. In most cases, your employer is also going to require it. So you want to come out of these classes with some really good skills in documenting the process. And then as I talked about, it's your work. You're getting paid the big bucks as an engineer. They're investing you in the process or they're investing in you because you know this process and therefore you want a complete record that that process happened. Now, some of your advisors are also going to ask you to maintain a traditional handwritten design notebook, okay? I actually think this is not a bad idea. Um, it is going to be optional for the class, but you need to follow the directions for your advisor. And if your advisor requires it, your advisor requires it. Um, why is there value? And by the way, I do keep handwritten records of everything that I do. Now, it doesn't mean I, I use the heck out of Google Docs. I have you know all my PowerPoints and Word documents. I use Google Drive, I use Box, I actually use Dropbox. I'm constantly shifting and, and moving digital data around. I'm doing this presentation obviously on Zoom, you know, so I'm I'm manipulating things up through YouTube and other platforms. But there is value in handwriting. Let me just talk about that a little bit. Um, when you write things down by hand, it does help you to better understand material. So that's one of the reasons why if you're keeping all of your class notes on your phone or a laptop or a tablet, you may find it being more effective if you're writing by hand. Lots of reasons why. First of all, you're using different parts of your brain. If you have to process and summarize information, again, it, it uses different parts of your brain that is more likely to cement memory, uh, recall, learning, retention, and there's lots of data to show that this is the case. Um, if, you're, if you're doing things by hand, you'll notice that in my, this is not a design notebook, but it is basically a log of all of the work that I do on a daily basis. It's important that you do that in ink. Um, this was really critical back before patent laws changed just a little bit. You needed a super thorough and, and unerasable um, record of all of the design work that you have done. We oftentimes talk about numbering pages and you can buy notebooks that are pre-numbered largely because again, you can go back and you can determine if information has been taken out. You can also more easily create tables of contents and find other ways to refer to specific parts of your design notebook. It's also important whether you are keeping a hard copy, you know, the old school, I got a post-it note here, an old school a design notebook or, or the digital notebook, it's really crucial that you immediately record information as it's happening. 
And the reason for that is you're going to be busy. Like in, you know, this as students, right? You're super busy. And you might think like, oh yeah, I got to remember to write that down in my notebook. And three or four days later, going back and reconstructing your work can be super difficult. And in fact, I would argue it can be impossible as you get busier and busier in the work that you do. Make sure that you provide clear headers file names, dates on all entries, try to be consistent. And again, this also applies when we talk about a digital design notebook using Google Drive or whatever platform you choose to use. The traditional um, design notebook, oftentimes they're bound. Um, several features, oftentimes they have like glue binding. Again, I mentioned pre-numbered pages. Back in the olden days when it was more difficult to share information, you know, you couldn't 30 or 40 years ago, you couldn't just snap a photo of a page and send it off to a colleague. You actually had to like make a fax or, or send a photocopy to somebody. Or in the really old days, you actually had to have carbon copy backups. And you can still buy engineering design notebooks that have carbon copy ability, uh, probably not all that common. So anyway, this introduces you um, for part one, just kind of like, why do we do design notebooks? Some ideas, some of the differences between digital and the value of keeping a hard copy. In part two, we'll come back and we'll talk a, a quite a bit more about some specifics, some things that you need to keep track of. And again, um, look forward to you coming back to see part two.